Today I'm with a three-time member of Congress, the founder of Teammates, and arguably one of the greatest coaches of all time. Coach Osborne, it's great to be here with you today. Well, thank you. Um, I guess there are quite a few people would argue with that last statement that I <laughs> run the greatest, because we lost Oklahoma too many times, but uh, nice to be with you today. Thank you. Tell us of your Clifton strengths. What was the strength that you would say that you use most often throughout your career to be successful and why? <laughs> well, pretty tough question to start with. Uh, my strengths are belief and um, it's kind of the number one and that simply means that you have a strong set of core values and uh, some things that kind of help see you see your way through life struggles. Second is a achievement, and uh, sort of like um, I always feel something has to be accomplished every day. And uh, thirdly would be self-assurance. I guess I have confidence I can do things. Fourth is uh, relationships or relatedness. I'm not sure how it's phrased, but just uh, care about family, care about uh, people I know, care about relationships. And so those are, those are my, my strengths. And I think, uh, as I think about them, I think they're pretty, pretty consistent with, with uh, the way I've experienced life. So they uh, make a lot of sense. In your most recent book, you talk about the 1960s when you were a graduate student, mm -hmm. that you came upon a professor Don Clifton, who changed your thinking in terms of leadership uh, and psychology. Can you talk more about that moment? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it wasn't so much a, a moment as a, just a, a learning process, because at that time in the uh, ed, ed psych department and in psychology in general, there was a um, kind of a hardcore experimental wing and uh, they would start with rats and try to figure out why a rat would hit a certain bar for a certain pellet of food or why they would turn right or left. And then you had Pavlov and he was working with dogs. And I think the idea is, well, if you could understand rats and dogs and, and maybe chimpanzees, that eventually you'd be able to work up the phylogenetic scale to the point where you could actually figure out what was going on with humans. And um, Don was not of that particular uh, type. And um, I remember uh, that Don uh, talked about the fact that uh, in the uh, Korean War, that 38% of the uh, prisoners, the US prisoners died. And uh, physically they were treated pretty well. They weren't beaten, they weren't starved, they weren't tortured, but it was a totally negative environment where people were encouraged to inform on each other. They were even encouraged to inform on themselves. Anything in their past that they were ashamed of, they would talk about it. And if they did, then they got rewarded in, in some way, food or whatever. And so there was a, a total breakdown of trust, communication, and any sense of community among the prisoners and as a result, about 38% of them just laid in their bunks, turned their face to the wall, and they died. <laughs> and so Don thought, you know, if negativism can be that powerful, then maybe uh, positive reinforcement on the other side of it would be equally powerful. And so he, he was probably the pioneer of what is now called positive psychology and um, and so I could see a lot of sense to what uh, Don was was saying and doing. I think he had a, an organization, I think it was called Project. You may have no, know more about it than I, but where I think he was engaging a lot of his students to, to do something in the community. And, uh, and so uh, I, get, I think that carried over a lot into my coaching in that uh, traditionally, uh, coaches tend to be very authoritarian, very critical, 
sometimes uh, actually dehumanizing. And so we try to make sure that uh, uh, even though we corrected players, we didn't try to attack them personally. And we tried to do it in a way that was as positive as possible. So um, some guy might uh, miss a tackle. You could start calling them names, or you could say, no, uh, Jones, now, <laughs> you're normally a pretty good tackler. Remember, keep your head up, lock your, lock your arms, and drive your feet. And then the next time he does it, then you make a big deal out of it. You know, that's exactly what we're looking for. And so um, I think Don had an impact on, uh, on the way I coached and uh, the way I, I've tried to treat people over, over time. Coach, one of your recent chapters ends with the power of hope. And when we study the needs of followers in our strengths leadership sciences, we find that hope is one of the things that people need most. What strengths do you draw upon in order to drive hope throughout every leadership assignment you've ever had? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess uh, the thing that you're, you're looking at is that uh, some, sometimes in coaching particularly, uh, you have to demote a player from first team to second team or sometimes discipline that player. But I, I, th I think you always wanted to make sure that that player understood that you cared about him and that you wanted the best for them, and that whatever had gone wrong it could be righted. And, uh, and so I think probably, again, that has to do a certain amount with, with belief. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we, um, we've, been, we've really recently, particularly in teammates mentoring, spent a lot of time talking about hope and uh, that this is one of the most powerful things you can give a young person because so many kids today are growing up in circumstances that are really difficult. Uh, breakup of the family has been difficult. Over half of our kids are growing up without both biological parents. So over half have experienced a fairly significant trauma early in their life. And uh, there's so many mixed messages out there um, from the internet, social media particularly, sometimes the movies, and sometimes uh, music lyrics and on and on that are not particularly wholesome. And, um, and so a lot of them are growing up in circumstances and they soon assume that the future is going to look at what they're experiencing now. And if you can hold out the idea that, you know, this doesn't have to be the way it's going to be for the rest of your life, that, uh, you know, it is possible to get an education. It is possible to move through this thing and, uh, and, and come out on the other side of it. And uh, so we have found that hope is probably the most powerful thing that a mentor can give to a mentee is just the idea that it doesn't always have to be this way. And uh, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, so uh, we've, we've really tried to emphasize the importance of hope in the, the mentoring process. As someone who's been so successful with the theme belief, what advice would you give someone else who also has belief, who'd also like to lead in a similar way? Well, the thing about it is that life can be confusing and you're going to have some bumps in the road and uh, and you're going to have all kinds of people trying to push you and pull you one way or another so i think that it's important to have a uh, something that guides you through something that's consistent throughout your life and, and of course my my personal faith has served that role as well but i think it's good that you sit down and think things through long-term, long-haul, what's important. And uh, it isn't the rings and the watches. It isn't the financial uh, rewards. It's, it's more relationships and, uh, and trying to make sure that you're treating people in the right way and uh, that uh, in the long run, those, those players are not just good players, but they're people who can live a constructive life. And so 
Uh, it's been sort of a guiding area of my life to steer me through. And uh, the thing about coaching is that um, you're not here all the time. You're, you're here, you win, win a big game, and you lose a big game, and you're down there. And so it's uh, pretty much of an up and down decision, or uh, up and down profession. And sometimes it's what have you done lately that determines that. Uh, it's almost week to week. And um, so it's uncomfortable, but on the other hand, uh, you learn a lot. When you think about Achiever, what was it that you were trying to accomplish as a coach? Well, there are a variety of things. Naturally, if you didn't win a certain percentage of games, you weren't going to be employed. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Winning was important, but it wasn't the most important thing. You know, the most important thing was really uh, how we played the game. And uh, I drew heavily from a guy named John Wooden. John Wooden was a uh, basketball coach at UCLA. And uh, at one time, John, I think, had won 88 consecutive basketball games. So it's pretty unusual. And he and on a one 12-year stretch, he won 10 national championships. But he never talked about winning these players. And uh, he talked about the process, you know. Uh, first thing, how you put your socks on so you don't get blisters, how you bend your knees on a free throw, how you, how you pass the ball and so on. And so as I was saying earlier, I, we tried to break the game down into the, the components, the, the fundamentals and how well we did those things. And uh, and then I think also part of that was team chemistry. I think if players felt cared for and really felt committed to the program, uh, we would have some unusual uh, team chemistry. And an example of that was, I remember in uh, 1997, um, had two players, uh, Jason Peter and Grant Wistrom, both All-American players, and uh, they came in at the uh, end of the 96 season, and they said, well, coach, um, and I thought they're going to give me the speech. I've got to, I've got to do what's best for me and my family. And because uh, if they signed their name, they'd probably get $12 million just to sign their name. And they said, um, you know, we lost two games this year. I said, yeah, I knew that. And he said, well, uh, we didn't think that was very good. And I said, well, I agree with you. And he said, uh, we're going to come back. And we're going to win them all. And, uh, and they did. And without them, we would not have won them all because they were such strong leaders and they really set the tone. And so... Uh, uh, the process was really important. I, I never talked about winning either. I, I just talked about the process. You could stand up in front of a team and say, well, we got to win this game. You might get them all excited and they run out of the room saying, yeah, we got to win this game. But what does that mean? Uh, how does that translate into specifics? You know, you carry the ball high and tight so you don't fumble it. Uh, and you you keep your head up when you tackle and you do those kind of things. So it isn't just pure emotion that wins games, it's uh, the process. You would get into the office early every morning, you'd stay late. You worked an incredible amount to achieve everything it was that you achieved. Mm -hmm. Who were you coaching for? Were you coaching for the fans? Were you coaching for the players, your staff, your family? Who'd you have in mind? Well, I had in mind that uh, we prefer not to be fired, that was one thing. <laughs> but yeah, well, it's just uh, part of the deal. We'd start at seven, and uh, most days we'd end up about 10 or 11 and uh, at night. And, uh, but we tried to make sure it wasn't busy work. You know, we were really doing what we needed to do. But there's a lot of facets to the game, and, and the, the difficult part of that is that uh, it can, can place a burden on your family. And uh, so I tried to make sure that our, our players, our coaches worked on Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night. 
And then Wednesday, I, I said, okay, go home. Wednesday night, Thursday night, I'd take projector home and I'd be looking at film. But I'd have dinner with our, my family, my kids, at Wednesday and Thursday night, and then I'd do what I could uh, during the off season to try to make up for it. But uh, I guess if I have one regret is that I wish that I could have spent more time with my kids. It was a, it was a profession, you know, as I said, coaching here at Nebraska with a sparse population, um, it was going to take a lot of effort. And, uh, but uh, I have good kids and I'm really proud of them. And uh, so Nancy had to carry a lot of the load. What do you draw upon after a loss? When there's been a loss, the team's down, what strength do you draw upon in order to build them back up to get ready for the next week? Well, we, we try to look at, uh, at performance, not so much the final score. And so we try to make sure that over time our players understood that um, we're, we're trying to play at, at a, uh, a level of perfection. And, uh, and so we, we split things up into 12 offensive goals, 11 defensive goals, and about seven or eight kicking goals. And for instance, one would be uh, offensively no turnovers. And defensively, you, you're going to get three turnovers. And offensively, you're going to average five yards per play rushing the football. And defensively, you're going to hold them three yards or less. And on your average punt return, you're going to average 10 yards per return. And so those are all um, kind of minute things. But um, our players might win a game by 40 points. But if they, they didn't meet half their goals, they didn't feel very good about it. And uh, so we, we tried to break the game down into things they could control. And uh, sometimes you can't always control the final score, but you can control effort and you can control consistency and uh, how you practice and those kind of things. So the process became very important to us. If there was an aspiring coach that came to you and said, I'd like to build a strengths-based team, what would that look like and what advice would you have for that person? Well, I, I think it'd, it'd, be a, it'd be a good idea if you know what makes a player tick, if you know what their strengths are, uh, you probably would handle uh, a player a little bit different than somebody that had a different set of strengths. Uh, some, some kids, uh, respond pretty well to criticism and a more authoritarian uh, approach. And then some people, uh, they're pretty fragile. If, if you uh, raise your voice to them, they're, they're going to retreat. And um, so I think that it certainly makes you, uh, could make you a better coach. I came also to realize on my staff, you know, uh, when you talk about an assistant football coach, you assume, well, they're all the same. But some guys are really good with X's and O's. Some guys are really good at interpersonal relationships. Some are, are really good recruiters. And, uh, and, and so you try to make sure that uh, each coach is, is using his strengths to, to, the, to the fullest. And because uh, not every assistant coach has the same same outlook, same strengths. And People with Relator often have an unusual ability to build deep relationships with people throughout their life. How did you use that in your recruiting and in the development of the players that you had on your team? Well, I think sometimes in recruiting that uh, players are deceived. I'm not, I'm not going to use the term lied to, but... <laughs> There's a very strong inference that, well, you know, if you come here, you're going to start as a freshman. And you're going to be so important to us that if we need to, we'll build our whole offense around you, our whole defense, and, and a lot of things that uh, are really difficult to deliver on. And, uh, and so we, we pretty much told them how it was, that, uh, yeah, there's going to be four or five other guys at your position. And uh, this is not going to be easy. 
and we lost some players in the process because we weren't telling them what they wanted to hear. But on the other hand, I think there was a note of authenticity to what we were saying. And so I think a lot of players trusted us and they realized that they were probably being told some things from other quarters that were going to be hard to deliver. And, uh, and so as a result, uh, when, when we recruited a player, he was apt to be here for four years. Uh, you know, they, they rate recruiting classes and that's based on who comes in as a freshman. But uh, if they're not there two years later, you didn't have a good recruiting class. And, uh, and so uh, they, they stuck with us. And generally speaking, there was good, good team chemistry. And, and I think players understood that we cared about them as people, that uh, we certainly cared about them as football players, but we wanted to make sure they graduated, make sure that, that uh, they were supported in every possible way we could support them. And, uh, and so the good thing about coaching, those relationships uh, uh, continue. Now, you know, you, you have them for four years, but I still hear almost weekly or daily from some former player that uh, hadn't played for me for 30, 40 years. So, so that's been the good thing, the gratifying thing, the, the relationships. We didn't have the benefit of Clifton's strengths while you were a coach, but how did you use Don Clifton's strength psychology throughout your time to develop players uh, at the University of Nebraska? Well, I think, I think uh, knowing Don and know, knowing a little bit about his research uh, did lead me to believe that uh, positive reinforcement is much better than negativism. And so uh, even though we corrected a player, uh, and I remember, I remember having a couple of assistants that were pretty tough. And uh, once in a while, they'd come down pretty hard on a player. But when they walked off the field, they'd oftentimes have their arm around that guy. You know? And uh, so we wanted to make sure that the players understood that even though this was demanding, you know, going out there and degree weather and practicing twice a day and it's not easy but uh, the part of what we were putting them through was because we cared about them because we wanted them in the fourth quarter of a game to be able to perform well and uh, wanted to make sure they could do their best so we uh, we tried to make sure that it wasn't a negative environment and was one that players uh, understood that we loved them and we cared about them you tell a great story about the advice that you give to a quarterback if he had just fumbled and the way to speak to him positively when he comes back on the sidelines. Can you talk more about that? Well, yeah, there's a tendency, if you watch much TV, you'll, you'll see probably most of the time when that guy reaches the sideline, he's going to get a good tongue lashing. And, uh, and, and of course, nobody feels worse than that quarterback. I mean, he just fumbled the ball out in front of 80,000 people or however many, and he didn't want to fumble. And, uh, and so just chewing him out is not going to be productive. And, and so the main thing is just say, you know, remember, uh, carry the ball high and tight, take care of it, get, make sure you put it away and you're, you're a good player. And, you, you don't normally do that, and so just remember in the in the future to make sure that ball's high and tight. And uh, and so um, you you can correct and you can make sure people understand what you want, but you don't have to get personal. You don't have to call them a bunch of names and say you're the stupidest quarterback I've ever coached. Uh, that's not going to help at all. There are a lot of us Nebraska fans that wonder if you retired too early from mm -hmm. football. Uh, do you ever wonder that yourself? Well, not too much. I, uh, the thing, I guess the thing that was good about it, uh, see, I, I told Frank Solich about five years ahead of time, I said, uh, Frank had a chance to go to Wisconsin as the offensive coordinator. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm gonna go five years and then I'd like to have you be the, the head coach. And I couldn't control that for sure. And, and uh, 
So the five years came and uh, I felt I had to honor my commitment to Frank. And uh, so, yeah, I probably could have coached longer. But on the other hand, um, I didn't go out feet first. <laughs> What most coaches do, no matter how much they win, eventually uh, it catches up with you. And so uh, that part was good. But the reason I ran for Congress, I think I just had a lot of energy and a certain amount of restlessness, and I thought I still could do something. And uh, so I did that uh, for a while, and then came AD. And Now it sounds like throughout your coaching career, you often leaned on belief. When you made the transition to Congress, or even as athletic director, was there another strength that you drew upon, like self-assurance or responsibility, or was it also a belief that you were using in those leadership roles? Well, I suppose that uh, any time you, <laughs> you run for office, there has to be a little bit of self-assurance because uh, you know you're, you're going to be a target of whatever criticism, whatever people can find in your past that might be negative, uh, that's going to come be brought forward. So uh, a certain amount of self-assurance just to put yourself out there. You made some really difficult, I would say, controversial decisions in your run for governor. Was that self-assurance that you had in mind at that particular time? Self-assurance is often known as, of course, the theme that will be a contrarian or iconoclastic or at least someone that goes against the grain. Mm -hmm. And you made some, again, tough positions. Was that the theme that was influencing you at that time? After uh, looking at Congress, so so many people's vote was almost determined by the, uh, the amount of uh, contributions they'd received from certain areas. So I, I limited the uh, uh, contributions to $300, not very much from any individual, and I did not take large corporate sums. I did not take uh, money from uh, PACs, from the uh, special interest groups, because I, I wanted to make sure that the voters knew that, uh, that whatever I voted on, or however I voted, would be based on my best judgment, which at times probably wouldn't be quite what they agreed with, but at least it wouldn't be something that was bought and paid for. And uh, so anyway, that, and I suppose that has to do a little bit with belief, uh, just a set of standards. It wasn't I was trying to be holier than thou or anything like that. But um, I also found later on when I ran for governor that if you didn't take uh, money from special interests, they would immediately uh, turn against you because they feel like they, they had no leverage with you, you know, if you didn't take take the PAC money. And that, in terms of getting elected as governor, probably worked against me because most of those groups <laughs> endorsed the other party and uh, didn't endorse me. But anyway, that is, I just felt that um, such things as term limits and, and trying to handle and get, get some control over the, uh, the uh, uh, financial structure of, uh, of, of the electoral system was important. And uh, to get it back more like it used to be when the country was founded, people were merchants and farmers and they went to Congress for four years, six years, and then they went back home and they went to work and you didn't have a whole uh, cadre of people who were uh, professional politicians their whole life. According to the Gallup poll, Congress's approval ratings are really low today. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have for leaders in Congress today? <laughs> well, I don't know if you're going to be able to get people to vote themselves out of a job, but term limits would really help. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, there are some people there are some good people there. Uh, I remember one guy, a guy named Robin Hayes from uh, North Carolina, and uh, uh, he had to take a vote that was really going to be damaging. It was the correct vote, I think, and and he did it. He did what was correct, uh, but I remember he had tears in his eyes 
because he knew that that vote would quite likely cost him his job. And there are a few people like that, you know, they're not very many. And uh, so yeah, I think the structure of Congress could be improved upon and uh, it still beats most places around the world. But uh, you, need, you need people who are, are there for the right reasons, not for their own ego or not for financial reasons, but for serving people to the best of their ability. You talk about a pivotal moment in your childhood uh, when your dad went to World War II, mm -hmm. and that being something that inspired you to create teammates. Can you talk a little bit more about that pivotal moment and why it inspired you to help others? Well, I was, uh, I was four years old when the word came over the radio that uh, Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And uh, I don't remember that so well as I remember my dad's uh, reaction. He jumped out of his chair and he said, I'm going to get into this thing. And I really didn't know what it was, but I knew it was kind of a big deal. And so he left when I was four and uh, came home when I was nine. So he was gone for five years and uh, landed over in Normandy and across Belgium into Germany. And uh, I know that during the Battle of the Bulge, uh, we thought we, we didn't hear from him for two, three, four weeks. And I know my mom worked in an ammunition plant down in Grand Island and She'd come home, there'd be no letter, and she'd cry. And uh, so it was a difficult time. And um, in my class at school, I think there was only one other young person who uh, did, didn't have a dad gone. All of them had dads at home and, and moms. And, uh, and so I remember having a sort of a feeling that I was was not very worthwhile and uh, somewhat isolated. But um, I did have an uncle who lived across the road and he took an interest in me and uh, would take me hunting and fishing. And, and so I, I saw at that point uh, some of the power of mentoring, uh, you know, having somebody uh, who you could count on and somebody that cared about you. and. Uh, so I think that carried over into, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that was in the back of my head when we started teammates. The, the main thing that I saw was I saw the changes in, uh, in the players we recruited. Because when I started back in 1962, almost every player we recruited was from a family where you had both a father and mother and both biological parents were there. And the, um, the family unit was much stronger. As time went on, we began to have to go to one city to talk to the young man's dad and maybe in other cities to talk to the mom. And, uh, and then the drug culture hit in the late 60s, early 70s. And we began to have to drug test our players. And uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the messages kids were receiving were, were pretty much antisocial, and so I remember uh, getting up in front of our team one day and I just said, how many of you guys be willing to serve as a mentor to a seventh or eighth grade boy here in Lincoln, Nebraska? And I thought it'd be good for the mentees, but I thought it might also be good for the, the young men who are mentoring to serve somebody who couldn't do anything for you in return, at least on the surface, couldn't do anything for you in return. And so we had uh, 22 hands went up and uh, we matched them up. The Lincoln Public Schools cooperated and, and uh, we became a school-based mentoring program. And uh, now we've grown to over 10,000 matches and about 191 school districts across uh, five states. So it's like a lot of things that start, you. We thought, well, this is going to begin and end with 22, 25 football players, and, and it uh, just kind of took off and grew from there. Now, Teammates is considered a strengths-based organization. What does a strengths-based organization look like to you? 
Well, uh, at best, we try to make sure that the mentor and the mentee have uh, taken a strength finders, a strength index. And uh, we, we try to make sure that we're matching mentors and mentees that have some common interests, uh, have somewhat common view of the world. And, and, um, and so uh, we think that um, strengths has certainly been a, a, big, a big factor in determining uh, who would fit well with, with who. And, uh, and, and so you can almost doom a, a match to failure if you have somebody who's really aggressive and, and uh, carries the conversation all the time and is trying to fix somebody, and you have a young person who's very shy and sometimes reticent, maybe a little bit withdrawn, and, and they just don't react to that type of personality. And, and so um, uh, the matching is done primarily at the school level with the, the building, con uh, building coordinator. And that building coordinator knows the young people, and then they interview the, uh, the mentor and try to make sure that the match is good and, uh, and that the match is supported. And uh, so we, we use uh, strength finders extensively and try to make sure that we have strong matches. Coach, thank you for everything that you've done for our state. Uh, thank you for everything that you've done for Gallup. You've been a great advisor to us and thank you for leading so many strengths-based organizations. Mm, appreciate it, thank you.